before we get started, let me uh, ask, there are a lot of students in the back. There's lots of room down here on the floor. Uh, if you don't feel too conspicuous uh, sitting here, it'd be great to have down here rather than standing. So, any takers? Okay, I tried. Uh, so greetings everyone and welcome. Salam alaikum. Uh, on behalf of the University of Scranton, I want to welcome you all, students, faculty, administrators, and members of our local community. We have a bit of everyone here tonight. Uh, my name is Christian Crocus, and I teach in the theology department here at the university. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have a, a, a wonderful guest speaker, uh, Father Thomas Michel, but before, we, or before I introduce him uh, properly, I just want to thank a couple of our sponsors. Uh, from the University of Scranton, I'd like to thank especially the, uh, the Theology Department and the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And from outside the university, I want to thank Ebru TV, who is here recording the, uh, the session, and it will appear on a Turkish uh, uh, television channel, and also the Peace Islands Institute. But I especially want to thank uh, the, uh, the donors who have been the, the, the university's primary uh, partners in coordinating and funding this event, the Golden Generation Retreat Center. Uh, it's a local institute which is dedicated to interreligious and intercultural dialogue and understanding uh, from a Turkish Muslim uh, tradition perspective. And I think uh, Mr. Akso, I might like to say a word about the Golden Generation uh, Retreat Center before we introduce Father Michel. So, Mr. Akso, if you'd like to say something. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bekir Aksoy, and I am the president of Golden Generation Retreat, Worship and Retreat Center. It is located not too far from here uh, in Sailorsburg, just 45 minutes, maybe an hour. We are part of a movement, an Islamic movement, which is conservative. Uh, which is dedicated to the ideals of Islam, but probably which is the most secular, most modern, and most Western uh, movement in the Islamic world. We are part of that movement, and we are very fortunate that the spiritual guide behind all that, about five, six, maybe seven million people, are is our guest for the last uh, 12 years, since 1999. It is unfortunate that on our part, we were unable to take the message uh, just 50 miles, 100 miles away from our center for the last 12 years. I am very glad that uh, we have the final outreach tonight, although we have a very good relationship with Merriwood University. I believe that this is the first time we are having as golden generation an activity here uh, tonight at this university. I'd like to thank uh, all who are involved, the administration, Chris and Erkan, and Father Michel, who has traveled uh, such a long trip. Uh, the purpose, the mission of golden generation is dialogue. <coughs> We do not do Islamic activities and on the side we do the dialogue activities, but the center, the main essence of our mission is dialogue. Dialogue between the nations, races, religions, different sects, different understandings and different ideologies. It had originated in Turkey and it has become truly an international movement uh, this year. I hope that uh, we can learn from the experience of our Jewish and Christian friends and uh, you can learn from someone who will speak on our behalf tonight. Again, I would like to welcome everyone and I would like to thank everyone uh, who made tonight possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Axel. 
Father Thomas Michel is, is an American, and he's a Catholic Jesuit priest, but he actually belongs to the Indonesian province of the uh, Society of Jesus, of the Jesuits. Uh, that's where he joined the Jesuits, in Indonesia. And after studying Islam in the Middle East for several years, he received his PhD in Islamic studies at the University of Chicago, studying under the great humanist and modernist uh, Islamic scholar, uh, Fazlur Rahman. He spent the bulk of his professional career the last 35 years or so, studying, dialoguing, praying, thinking about Islam and the Christian-Muslim dialogue and Christian-Muslim uh, mutual understanding. And he's done that mainly by teaching Christian theology at Muslim universities and teaching Islam at Christian universities. So he has a really unique perspective. Uh, for several years, for 13 years in fact, he worked under uh, uh, Pope John Paul II in the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, where eventually he was in charge of the Vatican's relationship with uh, Muslims. Um, and he's also been uh, the head of interreligious dialogue for the Asian Federation, uh, the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences. And he's also been uh, very active in interreligious dialogue for the Jesuits themselves. Most recently, after teaching for several years at uh, the University of Ankara in, in Turkey, uh, Father Michel has returned to the United States. He took a, a chair in interreligious dialogue at John Carroll University in Ohio last year, and this year he's a Woodstock Fellow at Georgetown University. He's published 20 books. I'm not going to list them. Um, uh, many of them, uh, most of them independently, a few with co-authors. And he's uh, published uh, nearly 200 scholarly articles. I really won't list those. Uh, and he's written on a wide range of topics, anything you can imagine that has to do with Islam or Christian-Muslim dialogue, including um, Islam in Asia, Islamic spirituality, ex Islamic uh, humanism, Islamic refutations of Christian do doctrine, Islam and pacifism, the Jesuits in Islam, Christian understandings of Islam, and on and on and on. Okay. Uh, but tonight, Father Michel will uh, do what he does so well, and that's to speak from his own experience. These long experiences as a Catholic priest living among Muslims and, uh, and enriching and cultivating his friendships with Muslims. His talk is entitled, uh, A Catholic Priest Among Muslims, What I Have Learned. And Father Michel will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll break for about 15 minutes of questions, at which point I ask you, please, to, uh, you know, if something's at the back of your mind, ask. And at the conclusion of the lecture, you'll be invited to share some uh, Turkish treats, which are outside the room, uh, courtesy of the, the Golden Generation uh, Center. So uh, please help me in welcoming Father Thomas Michel. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming this evening. I'm, I'm really, it's uh, amazing to see so many of you here. And thank you for turning out this evening. I want to thank the people at University of Scranton for inviting me to speak and to share with you some of the things that I've learned during the many years that I've lived and worked with Muslims. I should probably, uh, well, Christian, uh, Christian is, is uh, has stolen a bit of my thunder, but I, I, I want to tell you a little bit of, of who I am, how I got into this, uh, what I've been doing. As you heard, I'm, I'm a Catholic priest and a Jesuit. I've just started working at the Jesuit Theological Center in Georgetown, Woodstock Theological Center. But for the past 40 years or so, I spent my time involved with Muslims. About half the time, as you heard, I teach Islamic studies in Christian and secular, secular universities. I've taught in Turkey and in uh, Iran and Indonesia and Libya, Kyrgyzstan. And about half the time I teach uh, uh, Islamic studies in Christian and secular universities and the rest uh, Christian theology and Muslim institutions. I've lived uh, very often in cities in various countries where I was the only Christian. And the Muslim students that I taught, I was the first Christian they had ever met. It was actually at the suggestion of Muslims that I got into this uh, work. I was in Indonesia. I was, I was teaching, I, I, 
I wound up in Indonesia because I was a, I was ordained a diocesan priest in St. Louis. And I was working in a parish, and my bishop had been at the council with a bishop from Indonesia, and he said, could you send me a priest to teach English uh, in the seminary and in the teacher's college we have there? So I was in Indonesia and teaching uh, English, and I really loved it there. I, I loved everything about Indonesia and wanted to stay. And uh, so my bishop suggested it'd be a good idea if I join a religious order. And so I joined the Jesuits in Indonesia. That's how I happened to be a member of the Indonesian province. So my provincial said, well, start asking around, talk to people, and see uh, what the needs of the province are, of what society is here in Indonesia. See how you can contribute, what you can offer to this. So I was asking different people. And I also mentioned to my students, well, about half my students were Muslims. Almost half were Christians, and there were a few. Hindus and Buddhists. And some of the Muslim uh, students, they had an idea. They said, why don't you study Islam? That way you can help Christians and others to come to a better understanding of what Islam is about. And you can also help Muslims to come to know better Christian uh, teaching. And, uh, and I like the idea. I, I, I can remember going back to my room and I started thinking about it. And in the days and weeks that followed, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and praying. And I got my copy of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And it was still a new copy because the council had only ended about four years previously. And uh, so I opened it up to see what the council said about Muslims. And there were three, three phrases that, that that really struck me and stayed with me during these 40 years since. This was in 1969. The first one said, uh, the church looks upon Muslims with esteem. And I thought, we do? I, uh, I had nothing against Muslims. I didn't know any Muslims before I went to Indonesia, but I didn't know we were supposed to esteem Muslims or why. And, and I got an idea, my first clue, really, of what direction my life would take. I would try to find out the reasons for this esteem that we should have for Islam, and I would learn to communicate this esteem to others. Well, the second phrase that struck me in the, in the document was, Muslims worship with us the one God. I had never really averted to the implications of Muslims and Christians together worshiping the same God. How can we be enemies? How can we see each other as rivals if we're both standing in worship before the one God? But it was the third phrase I think that's had the most influence on my subsequent life. And that was the final words in the statement uh, of Nostra Aetate about Muslims. It says, even though in the course of history there have been many conflicts between Muslims and Christians, this synod, meaning the council, urges all to move beyond the past and to work together for the common good in the area of peace, social justice, moral values, and human freedom. The implication of this is really sweeping when you think of it. it. Means that Muslims and Christians together have a task, a common task in our modern world to work together in four key areas of modern life, to build peace together, to work together for social justice, to defend moral values together, and to work for true human freedom. Well, this was a project I wanted to be part of, and it pretty well describes what I've been doing for the past 40 years or so. My life has been rather unusual for a Catholic priest in that I've spent most of my time in dialogue with Muslims, sharing life with them, and reflecting upon relations as two communities of faith standing before the one God. 
Now, the most basic thing that I've learned, I think, in these 40 years is that Islam is a faith. It's a way of living before God, of responding to the daily commands of the Creator. We will never understand Muslims and what is happening in the Muslim world unless we realize that for Muslims, God stands at the center. God is the driving force of all that occurs. Whatever constructs we come up with about Islam as a civilization, as a sociological phenomenon, a cultural tradition, an historical movement, or a geopolitical force, they will all miss the mark and not address Muslims' identity and self-understanding if we forget their commitment to God as the center of human life and as the formative core of human community. Like me, I think that many of you watched the protests in Egypt unfold last year. Actually, back in the 1970s when I was studying Arabic in Cairo, I used to live a block away from Tahrir, our liberation square, but the building has since been torn down to widen the road. But what struck me as I watched the live coverage on Al Jazeera television was how at noontime and mid-afternoon, at the call to prayer, these tens of thousands of protesters, without discussion or fuss, or trying to make a statement, silently formed lines across the square, faced Mecca, and worshiped God. The police who were patrolling the square to maintain order lined up side by side with the protesters and performed the prayer. Afterwards, the protesters stood up and resumed their claim to their democratic rights. The interesting thing is they were aware of their obligations to God even in the midst of their calls for dignity and justice. Now, in saying this, I, what I've said so far is, is very positive, but I can't pretend that there are not serious problems and real challenges to our living together. The worldwide Muslim community has, like its Christian counterpart, and in fact, all human communities, its hypocrites, its cultural adherents, and its miscreants. It has its share of those who are motivated by anger and resentment. It has those who believe that they, and only they, possess truth and that others are in error. But what religious community, including our own, does not possess such people? Moreover, I'm aware that many of the grievances that Muslims feel towards Christians, towards Western nations, toward our own nation, are justified. Resentment doesn't arise out of nothing. It comes from fe people feeling that they have been wronged, that others have imposed their will on them and treated their most sacred beliefs with disrespect. So if we as Christians feel that Muslims are the problem and don't realize that equally we are the problem, then I think real harmony and understanding will never be achieved. I've also learned down through the years that not everyone wants interfaith harmony. Some Muslims, like some Christians, are violent, and some of them offer religious justification for violence. We should be careful not to exaggerate, though. In real life, those who support and follow the path of violence are extremely few. Still, I have Christian friends who were proponents of dialogue who were killed. I have good friends who were killed. But I also acknowledge the heroism of a 26-year-old Muslim stock clerk, the father of two, 
who died removing a bomb from a Christian church in Indonesia, where tens of thousands of Muslims in his Islamic youth organization had committed themselves to protecting Christian places of worship. This was in 1990, 1998. Somebody said a bomb threat that there would be a bomb in one of the churches uh, before Christmas. This was, of course, to, to frighten the Christians. And, and, uh, and so the uh, largest Islamic youth organization in the country, that of Natad al-Ulama, they said, we will protect the churches. We'll do two things. Before, before services on Christmas, or midnight mass in the Catholic churches, we'll sweep the churches and make sure there's no bombs. And secondly, we will form a human cordon around the churches, making sure nobody gets in who's not supposed to be. Well, one of them, this, this young man named Rianto, he, uh, he did find a bomb. He found the only bomb. And he was carrying it gingerly out of the church, past the parking lot, and was about to throw it in a ditch outside when the bomb exploded. And he was the only victim that year of uh, violence. Another time when I was teaching in, in the southern Philippines, rebels armed with submachine guns came to class. And they stood in the back of the classroom and, and they were saying, we want this foreigner to come with us. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Uh, but fortunately for me, there was a... Uh, middle-aged Muslim woman in the class, and she turned around and she was speaking to them real strongly in, in her language, in Maranao. And, uh, and the four guys with their submachine guns kind of sheepishly backed away and went off. And, <laughs> and uh, so afterwards I said to her, I said, what did you say to them that it made them leave? She said, I told them this was education. This was something serious and they should get out and go back where they, where they were. And, uh, and so they did, thank goodness. Uh, what's my point? My point is that in the world we live in, violence and heroism, peacemakers and villains, saints and troublemakers are all part of the terrain. And in this, Muslims are no different from anyone else. But I have to say also that the vast majority of Muslims whom I have known and lived with over the past 40 years, the literally thousands, and I, it's probably closer to tens of thousands of people in many countries with whom I have worked and debated and eaten and laughed, they profess Islam as a religion of peace. And they have welcomed me, an American Christian priest, with hospitality, warmth, and I'm not exaggerating, with love. Their lives from birth to death, and those of their children and grandchildren, are peaceful and untouched by violence. These are the people who have borne witness to me that Islam is a religion of peace. But let me explain what I mean by, by the term dialogue, which I think sometimes can give the wrong impression of what we're about. Dialogue can sometimes conjure up the idea of an interfaith sharing of coffee and cookies with Rabbi X and Cardinal Y and Imam Z sitting down to make small talk, all nervously trying to avoid any issues or comments that might explode in their faces. Or at a more academic level, we can imagine dialogue as an interfaith collection of intellectuals, university professors, columnists, politicians, discussing the affairs of the day. Now these are definitely types of dialogue, and they do have a long-term value, which I'll discuss in a little bit, but they are somewhat rarefied types of encounter, and they don't affect many people or make real changes in society. By contrast, I'll offer this example that I've taken from the southern Philippines of a different kind of dialogue that we promoted in Asia. It's actually still, been go it's still going on now. 
Uh, it's called MUKARD. MUKARD is an acronym that means Christian Muslim Agency for Rural Development. Muslim Christian Agency for Rural, De rural Development, MUKARD. Uh, it's an umbrella organization made up of mosque and church-based associations in more than 120 villages in uh, the island of Mindanao, southern Philippines. It's been operating quietly and effectively since 1984. In each village, an interreligious committee operates independently and chooses its projects according to local needs. Muslims and Christians came together after the violence that occurred in the 1970s. They intuited that by working together for the benefit of everyone, they could also overcome ethnic and religious suspicion and strife. In the beginning, they began with simple, obvious projects, all-weather roads, pickup trucks to take the fish to market in a fishing village, seminars to teach crop rotation, introduce new types of seed and animal species, daycare centers for working mothers, income generation projects for village women. And over the years, their approach has become more sophisticated with projects for combating climate change, providing safe water supplies, developing integrated agroforestry, and microfinance for small and medium-sized enterprises, all the while promoting peace and harmony between the diverse communities. Now, it's important to note that MUCARD is not just another rural development agency. It is an organization consciously rooted in the mosques and churches in worship of God, promoted in Friday and Sunday sermons, and carried forward in lectures and workshops about each other's religions, moments of joint fellowship, and the common celebration of religious and national holidays. Now, Mukhart is just one of the examples I, I could have chosen. I really could have mentioned many examples. It's a rural-based organization of agricultural and fishing villages, but it has its urban counterparts where Muslims and Christians work together to respond to the needs of squatters, slum dwellers, and day laborers. This Filipino dialogue movement has its counterparts elsewhere. In Indonesia, for example, people were shocked at the communal violence that took place in some parts of the country during the late 1990s, after which many came together in efforts at prevention to build and reinforce harmony before any new outbreak of hostilities could occur. Uh, a recently published directory that I was looking at uh, lists over 300 uh, distinct dialogue associations in Indonesia that are aimed variously at reconciliation, communal harmony, and social service on an explicitly religious basis. Last year I was in Jombang in East Java with a group of Muslims and Christians on the occasion of the Chinese New Year, we paid a friendly visit to the Chinese temple and shared a meal with Confucian, Buddhist, and Taoist neighbors. The Chinese, I saw, are equally welcome at the city's mosques and churches. The religious communities in Jombang have appealed to the government to have their city declared officially the city of harmony. Now, I mentioned before, there is a particular role, role that the religious leaders can play in peacemaking and peace building. In such diverse countries as Sierra Leone in West Africa, or Indonesia and the Philippines in Southeast Asia, it was the religious leaders who were able to broker a peace agreement in situations of conflict and civil war. The religious leaders are in a kind of a 
especially good place to do this. They have the social mobility to bring together the views and concerns of all parties to establish and maintain a peace agreement. A typical day might include a breakfast meeting with farmers or factory workers, lunch at a women's cooperative, <clears throat> and uh, dinner with government ministers or military leaders. Moreover, the religious leaders are often closer to the preoccupations of the common people than our government officials, our army officers. And also they're more trusted as spokespersons who will faithfully represent the concerns of those in the community. However, it's possible for the religious leaders to act together as effective builders of peace only when they already know and trust each other. And this is what's done through dialogue meetings, luncheons, here even coffee parties have a function. For example, in the Philippines, the Bishop's Ulama Conference, made up of Catholic and Protestant church leaders and the members of the Council of Muslim Religious Scholars and Imams, it's been the single most effective association for maintaining the peace in Mindanao by studying and reflecting on the needs of their region and representing their concerns with a common voice, very important, to the central government. They've been meeting now for 13 years, every two weeks, and they've studied every possible aspect of life in the southern Philippines, economic, educational, questions of youth, uh, questions of drugs, questions of smuggling, uh, questions of ecology, and they've been bringing in experts. They, they are some of the most well-informed, best prepared religious leaders that I know in anywhere in the world. And they've really made a difference. For one thing, they, they've been attacking the underlying causes that, that result in, in, in unrest. Uh, another example was from Indonesia in the, in the 90s. I was there then. We had some terrible fighting in parts of Indonesia. But I am convinced that the main reason why the fighting did not spread to the other islands, and there it would have been really disastrous because some of those other islands much more populous, is that the religious leaders kept making joint statements in favor of peace, saying, do not fight. This is not what Islam teaches. This is not what Christian faith teaches. And trying to get people to lay down their arms and stop fighting. You know, it's hard to judge what would have happened if something else had not happened. But I'm, I'm convinced that we were really heading towards uh, a, a big conflagration in, in Indonesia. And it was, and it was, uh, it was headed off by the cooperation of, uh, of our leadership. Well, so far, most of my examples have been taken from Southeast Asia, where I spent most of my life in the 1980s and 1990s. But in the time remaining, I want to turn my attention to the country where I was living until just a few months ago, that is Turkey. In the 1980s, I was working in the Vatican in charge of Muslim Christian relations. We have what's called a, an office for Islam. And, and, I, uh, and I was in, in, the, in charge of that. And we got an invitation from the rector of the University of Ankara in Turkey. He wrote to the Pope and he said, uh, we, would you send us a professor of uh, Christian theology? Well, of course, the Pope doesn't answer all of these questions, all of these letters that he gets personally. He sends them out to the proper uh, office. And so since I was in charge of the Office for Islam, basically they said, find somebody to go to Turkey. And uh, well, back in the 80s, this was still a new thing. And uh, it was hard to, to, to really find somebody. Uh, somebody said, oh, well, I got, I got uh, tenure. I can't get away. Somebody else said, I have family situation. I can't go. Other person said, I'm not, I'm not prepared for it. So after, after trying this for some time, we had a meeting in the Vatican. 
and we said, here we keep talking about dialogue, and here's some people who invite us, and we can't find anyone to go. So to make the long story short, I went to Turkey in 1986, and I've been going almost every year since then for a longer or shorter period. Most of the time, uh, I would go for a, a, a semester. Well, the program in, in the, the Turkish Divinity Schools, there's 23 of them connected with state universities. It's a four-year program with a, a propedeutic year of learning Arabic before you start. And in the course of this program, there's what they call uh, history of religion. So there's a module on, on Judaism, there's a module on Christian religion, there's a module on uh, um, Asian religions, Hindu, Buddhist, etc. And uh, so when I teach, I, of course I teach the, uh, the, the thing on Christian theology. Uh, now, basically I found the students really, um, what would you say, at the beginning, some of them wanted to do uh, polemics. They wanted to prove that Islam was better and Christianity was inferior, or else they wanted to prove that Islam was true and Christian Christianity was was false. But I, I felt that these attitudes didn't really go very deeply. After the novelty of my presence wore off, and after day after day we're drinking tea together and eating our lunch together, then they their attitudes changed, and they really wanted to know more. And we had we had really some 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 good discussions. I thought it was it was really it was good. I, I, I loved it. I, I, I really miss it. Uh, I, last December, I was in, a, in a southeast Turkey in a city called Diyarbakir, and there were over a thousand people that, that, that came uh, to, the, to the lectures. It was at the university, but it was open to whoever wanted to come. So there really a lot of, lot of interest. But my work in the universities in Turkey is only a part, and maybe not the most important part, of the dialogue that I carry on daily in, in Turkey. Mostly it's with committed Muslims, workmen, shopkeepers, engineering students, primary school teachers, for whom the desire to serve God and others is at the center of their lives. Uh, it was also in Turkey that I really came to know two really great Muslim thinkers. And this has really occupied a lot of my scholarly research, you might say, in the past uh, 15 or 20 years or so. The first of these was a man named Sayyid Nursi. And he, uh, he was actually a man of Kurdish origin. Uh, and he wrote a 6,000 page, not 600, 6,000 page commentary on the Quran. And uh, he already a hundred years ago, 101 years ago in 1911 to be exact, he was saying that Muslims should be united with the real Christians who are following the teachings of Jesus in order that we should offer to the world a common witness of values based on, on, on the word of God. He was talking about cooperation with Christians. This is already 50 years before the Second Vatican Council encouraged us as, as Catholics to do this. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he was really quite a, a, an, an interesting uh, thinker. He said, the days of jihad of the sword are over, finished. He said, today the only proper jihad for Muslims is jihad of the pen or jihad of the word. In other words, by writing and talking, trying to convince people, trying to persuade people. Uh, and, and, he, and he applied the principle of attraction. He said, Muslims should live in such a way that other people will be attracted to Islam. One of his ideas that has had really a lot of influence on many people, he said, who are the enemies of Muslims and other believers. Is it this group of people or that group of people? He said, no. He says, the, the enemies of any modern believers are three. Ignorance, 
poverty and disunity. Ignorance, poverty, and disunity. He said, these are the common enemies that we all have. Well, he was, he was a good man. He died in 1960, shortly before he died. He sent a copy of his Quran commentary to uh, Pope Pius XII, who was the pope then. The pope wrote him a nice uh, letter back. I've seen, I've seen the letter of, of the pope. I saw a copy of it, not the original, uh, to uh, Sayyid Norsi. He also went and visited the Orthodox Patriarch in, in Istanbul. So he was somebody who sincerely believed in this. Well, sociologists tell us that somewhere between 8 and 13 million people continue to study his commentary on the Quran. I know in Ankara, where I was living until just a couple months ago, there were about 90 groups that met every week. I would go and meet with many of them. Uh, sometimes I'd go to a couple a week. Most, most weeks I'd just go to one. I'd pick one and go to that. And they would be studying. They'd, they'd read a passage from his Quran commentary. And then they would have like faith sharing. They'd try to say, well, what does this mean to us? What does this mean to our lives and for our lives? Very good, low key thing. They would just sit and, and discuss this. Well, one of the people who was uh, influenced by the writings of Sayyid Norsi was another Turkish scholar, the one that Mr. Aksay had mentioned earlier, Fethullah Gülen, who lives nearby, who lives up near, where is it, Bethlehem or somewhere, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're in Pennsylvania, aren't we? Where are we? I'm, I, I just came from New Jersey. And, uh, okay, so not so far from here. Uh, but see, the, the, the real genius of Mr. Gülen was he took up Sayyid Norsi's idea that the real enemies of, of humankind are three, ignorance, poverty, and disunity. And he says, what we have to have are institutions to fight these enemies. So to fight the enemy of ignorance, he set up schools, a new kind of education. He says, we, we have to draw from what's best of all the different uh, types of education that are available. So you give a strong scientific background, you give a good character formation, you, you try to develop discipline. And uh, so these schools are, are, are really quite, uh, uh, quite successful, even here in, in our own country. And to fight poverty, they've set up a welfare organization. It, you look at its website, it's called Kim Seyokmu, has a Turkish name. Uh, but you look at its website, and it doesn't look much different from what we do in, in Catholic Relief Services. It has a very large budget. It's up to $42 million uh, last year. They fed over a quarter of a million people last year during Ramadan. And they've gone from relief work of just taking care of victims of, of drought or earthquake or, or, or flooding into development work. So they're working very, very hard in parts of, of Africa, like the Darfur region of Sudan, Somalia, uh, Niger, Mali, uh, to bring uh, fresh drinking water. That's their kind of big project. And to fight disunity, they've set up these dialogue associations everywhere. Uh, in the United States alone, there's over 200 of them. And the idea is simply to bring people together uh, uh, so that they get to know each other. The idea is it's, is it's ignorance of one another that's keeping us apart. So you fight disunity by bringing people together. I was talking to a priest in, uh, in, in New Jersey, Patterson actually, and he said uh, to me one time, he said, you know, these Turks have really transformed our community. He said, the place where I met the for the first time, the Jewish rabbi was at the Turkish Community Center. And well, it's to me, I think it's very impressive. It shows what a small immigrant group can do. A minority group, if they really are committed to something, they, they, they can really bring it off. So they're one of our sponsors tonight. This is the sort of thing they do is they get people together to talk about situations of 
dialogue. Well, my time is almost up, but I do want to conclude with one point that I want to illustrate with a story. Uh, see, I think some things we can only learn through dialogue. You can't, you can't find out in a book. You can't even learn in a lecture, but you, you can learn when, when we share life together. The story I want to tell you is happened in 1988, or else it was 1989. I was teaching in, in Konya in Turkey. Konya is the ancient Iconium. It's also, it's also the place where the great Sufi poet Jalaluddin Rumi, Mevlana, where he uh, wrote his poetry. So I was supposed to be teaching there, and, and I showed up. And they gave me some money for an apartment. Not very much, but it was enough to find a, a good apartment. I found a nice little place in a kind of working class area. And it was very clean, uh, but empty. It was really empty. There wasn't a, a spoon or a fork. There was nothing, you know, no toothpick. And so I was thinking, oh, this is going to really be expensive. I'm going to have to buy everything. I had nothing uh, just, just to live. How much? basic things do you need? But somebody at the university told me, well, we know some people who've got an extra bed. So that, if you go and ask them, uh, they might let you use their bed. So I thought, well, that's a start. So I went down and I asked the people, I said, I just come to town and I heard they had a bed that maybe I could borrow for the next six months. And they said, yes, yes, you can do that. So right away, I picked up the bottom part, the springs of the bed and started carrying it down on my back to the house that I had rented, which was still absolutely empty at that time. Well, it was a Saturday morning and everybody was out. They were on their way to the market or coming home from the market and standing around chatting and all this. And they saw this foreigner carrying a bed on his back. And so a couple of people stopped me and they basically said, well, who are you? And, uh, and I said, oh, I'm an American professor. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be teaching here. So you'll be teaching. Oh, you'll be teaching uh, English? And I said, no, actually, I'll be in the theology department. And so more and more people were coming at this point. It was getting to be a little crowd. And, uh, and I said, I'll be in the theology. Oh, you're Muslim. I said, no, actually, I'm, I'm Christian. They said, Christian, really? Uh, well, welcome. Uh, and they, somebody said, well, are you, are you here with your family? And I said, no, uh, I, I'm not married now. Here I had a problem. I didn't know the word in Turkish, where I was speaking in my very primitive Turkish. I didn't know the word for priest. But in the Quran, there's the Quranic word rahib for monk. And I thought, well, that's close. That's, uh, I'm almost a monk. So I said, uh, I said, I'm a rahib. And they said, really? And somebody said, I've never met a rahib before. And, uh, and so, People were very welcoming, and somebody else said, well, do you need anything? I said, I need everything. <laughs> and uh, I've got as a bed standing here, half of it. And, uh, and so people said, well, chairs, you need chairs? I, I said, I need chairs. And, and so people started bringing things. So for the next three days, people would stop by, and they, they'd have a bunch of things, some people being glasses or, or other chinaware for the kitchen. And, and uh, I, I got two carpets, and I got a second bed to go along with the first one. Uh, somebody gave me a little hot plate to cook my food on. Somebody else brought a small refrigerator. And uh, that second night, about 11 o'clock at night, there was a knock on the door, and the two men were standing there. And they said, we'd like to see your house. And I said, well, come in. And uh, so they came in. They kind of ignored me. They went out in the kitchen and started opening the cabinets. And uh, the one guy says to the other, now look, how's he going to prepare his food? There's no table here. Now your sister has in her garage that little table that'll fit right in here. And the other guy said, oh yeah, you're right. He said, oh, we'll get the table. And then they were looking in the cabinets. Look, he's only got three glasses. We'll bring the, we got extra glasses. We'll bring the glasses. So they were really taking inventory with everything I still needed. The next day they showed up with plastic bags and, and, and all sorts of stuff. Anyhow, the house was completely furnished, fully furnished. Well, the next day was Monday, and I went for my first day to the uh, university. 
And I came back uh, about 5.30, we, we got out at five, and then I came back. There was a man sitting on the stoop. I didn't know who he was. And so we introduced each other, and he said, I live in the neighborhood here, and welcome to the neighborhood. And I said, thank you. And he said, uh, my wife came by earlier today, but uh, she couldn't get in, the door was locked. And I said, uh, yes, I, I did lock the door this morning before I went to the university. He said, oh, you don't have to do that. He said, the women in the neighborhood, they know who comes and who goes. And, and if somebody is here that doesn't belong, they, they'll take care of it. <laughs> so I, I thought, what is he trying to tell me? And I realized that by locking my door, I was telling them that I didn't trust them. So I never locked my door again for the next six months. And, uh, and it was really nice. Sometimes I would come home in the evening and on the counter there'd be sitting a covered dish and inside it there'd be some rice and some eggplant and some lamb and uh, it'd be enough for two or three days. I'd eat it, you know, and wash the dish and set it aside and a couple more days it would disappear. And <laughs> other days I'd come home in, in, in the afternoon and uh, I find all of my shirts had been washed and ironed and they're <laughs> hanging on hangers. Some other times it had all be cleaned up and swept, you know, and all the newspapers gathered up into a pile and that. Well, this went on for six months, for a whole semester. And so finally it was time for me to leave Konya. And uh, so there was a man standing around. He, I mean, he came over to say goodbye and we were talking. And I said, I, I've got a final request. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, for six months now, the women in the neighborhood have really been good to me. They've been bringing me food and they've been washing my clothes. They've been cleaning the house. I've never seen them, uh, but I, I would like to meet them just once if I could and thank them. And his answer really surprised me. I won't ever forget it. He says, you don't have to thank them. They didn't do this for you. They did this for God. And God who sees what we do secretly will give them their reward. And then he went on, he said, the, uh, the Quran tells us that we should be hospitable to strangers in our midst. And it says especially we should be, we should be welcoming to rahipler, to, to, to monks. And uh, uh, he said, so these women, he says, they were just following their religion. And I really learned something then, you know, about the religion of Islam that I had not learned in all of my graduate classes at University of Chicago or in all the books that I read, that hospitality is, is, is an act of worship. It's an act of worship to God. You know, we, we always read about the Middle East that hospitality is so important. Well, it's not by accident. It's part of their religion. So what I, what I encourage everybody to do, our time is, is, is about up, but we'll have time for, for questions and answers. You know, get to know each other. Take all the opportunities and create opportunities uh, to know each other. Coming back to the States, I find that people who don't know Muslims have never met a Muslim, have never had a meal in a Muslim's house or they and theirs that they're the people who tend to be very prejudiced and hateful towards Muslims. People who know Muslims have a very different idea. So I've been blessed. I think that over the course of the last 40 years that I've lived with Muslims, I'm, I'm convinced that God has made me into a better person and a better Christian and a better priest through the Muslims that I've known. And this also gives me a lot of hope that if God has been so powerfully at work in my life through my encounters with Muslims, God is also at work in theirs so that I can be as much a blessing to them as they to me. Thank you. So we have a, a break and then questions or a question and then break. I think we're going to do questions and then break. Is that okay? Sure. Fine, yeah, fine, okay. fine. Okay.
Uh, so thank you, Father Michel. Uh, I think we've all been uh, really treated here tonight. So we have time for a few questions before we invite everyone to enjoy some of that hospitality that Father Michel uh, mentioned here. So uh, if you have a question, maybe just raise your hand and I'll call on you and go. Who will get us started? Please. Yes, sir. Father, did you experience any Sharia law with the people in the different countries you've been? No. Uh, well, the, the Sharia is not applied uh, civilly in, in either Turkey or in Indonesia. Uh, in Indonesia, it's applied but only in the matter of uh, marriages and inheritance, and in that only to Muslims. But by Sharia law, maybe you mean the hudud, the, the, the punishments. Um, no, those, those are only applied in a few Muslim countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, um, Sudan. Most Indonesia, they don't have Malaysia, they don't have Philippines, uh, Turkey, certainly not. Uh, yes, yes. Do you think if you uh, had read the Vatican, the Second Vatican document, you would have gone down the path that you have gone down? I think probably. I think I, I am. A, a product of the Second Vatican Council and its decree on on interreligious uh, dialogue. Yeah. Now maybe I would have been open-minded without having read that. Maybe I would have liked my. I already liked my Muslim students before I ever read the the Document Council, and they were very good. Probably that's one of the reasons why they why they suggested that I study Islam. Uh, so I, I, I probably would have, you know, liked the people that I met, but this idea of seeing this as kind of a, a, a as a mission to 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 try to build esteem for Islam, I don't think I would have ever had that idea. Or trying, or this understanding of of a common task for Muslims and Christians in our world. No, I, I wouldn't have come to that on my own probably. Yes, all the way in the back. Father, that was really beautiful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, a lot of us are in the midst of trying to master the new version of the Nicene Creed, which is taking <laughs> us into um, slightly different, very specific ways of understanding our faith. Uh, at the same time, you point out the, the ecumenical virtue of seeing ourselves as Catholics and Muslims worshiping the same God. Uh, do you have any pointers on how to, how to balance that move to more specific, more exact Catholicism and to a broader ecumenical spirit? Well, the, the documents and the statements are, are really good. I think that one big weakness that we have in the Catholic Church, and I include also the different times the organizations that I've worked for, whether it, whether it be uh, the Vatican or Jesuits or the Asian bishops or whoever, is I don't think that we are very good at publicizing and multiplying the good things that we do. We've had a lot of really good meetings, not only with Muslims, but good meetings with Jews, good meetings with people of other religions, Buddhists, and I organized many of them myself. Nobody knows about them. Now, it's not your fault that you don't know about them, but it is my fault that you don't, because we, uh, we, we, sh we should be better adept at, at publicizing uh, the things that we do. Um, that, that, that I think is a real weakness in, in our system. Now, see, I, I've been in, when I was in the Vatican, we had really a lot of good meetings. And we'd study things, we studied things about, about proselytizing, making converts, uh, Muslims and Christians, how do we go about it? When are you overstepping the bounds? When are you doing it wrong? When are you doing it right? What's the right way? What's wrong? We studied these things together. We put out a document, which nobody's read, and uh, it, 
you know, it's, 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 I think it's a real failing because what happens at the level of the Vatican? We get together with top leaders, top Muslim leaders, top Jewish leaders, whatever, and we make a, a joint statement. Well, all this can do is it should be farming all of us. It should farm our attitudes and, and what we see. But the real work of dialogue is what has to be done at the local level, even at the neighborhood level. And I think this is where the, where the Gulen community, like the Golden Generation group that I was talking about, this is part of their genius. They've, they've understood this, that it's got to be at the, at the level of, of, of where people live. And the, I think they are probably putting more material and human resources into dialogue at, the, at that level of neighborhoods and, and towns than, than anybody. So what happens at the Vatican has an importance in terms of formation of, of the peoples, but where, where a real dialogue where we really have to get to work and do much more is at the local level. See, I think on the, on the one hand, since 1965, there are so many, I, I could mention dialogue organizations and activities and good projects together in almost every country uh, where there are Muslims and Christians. Um, but at the same time, it's only scratching the surface. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There's this big mass everywhere of people who are still suspicious of the other and who still have a lot of uninformed prejudices about the other. We've had so much more of the work has, has got to be done. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, Father, I my first was inclined to ask this question this way. What is the role of Muslim women in this dialogue? But I could equally ask it, what is the role of Catholic women in the dialogue if we're going to go from the top? Uh, so is the role... <laughs> Because you mean because they're not there? The Vatican, as you well know. So, uh, is the work of Muslim women and, and Christian and Jewish women locally? Do yeah. you see Muslim women leading and participating there? Yeah, I think one of the most interesting organizations I've seen is WIND, W I N D, Women in Interreligious Dialogue. And you'll never guess where this started. It started in Reno, Nevada, in the shadow of the casinos. Uh, the uh, Muslim and Christian women, well, actually, it's broader. It's not just Muslim Christian. It's, it includes Jews and, and, and uh, Buddhists. Uh, they, they said, you know, most dialogue things are organized by men. And they're about the kind of topics that men want to discuss and they're carried on in the ways that men like to do things. And because of that, women feel kind of left out or kind of like spectators or like token people who've been invited, and, and, but it's not really theirs. So they started their own organization and they get together on the topics they find interesting. Uh, they'll invite men if, if, the, if uh, they feel that their topic is of interest to men and men want to come, but they, they organize it. Now, I was, last year, um, there's organizations in, in Africa, in, in Uganda, Tanzania, and, and Kenya, that invited me and a Muslim scholar, who's actually a um, Muslim chaplain at Duke University. Uh, we were invited to talk about dialogue. And so there was a group of Muslim and Christian women in, in Nairobi. And they were saying, we'd like to organize ourselves in, in, in a certain way uh, and, I, and so I told them about this wind experiment in Reno, Nevada, and uh, I, I put them in contact with the people in Reno, and they've started a wind now in, in Nairobi. And it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing. Now, we don't want to, to make some kind of a new segregation that women are, women are not uh, welcome at things organized by men and vice versa, no. But I think there is really a role, uh, especially because in Muslim society, uh, uh, it's, women relate to women mainly. And, uh, uh, 
And so if, if, if we're waiting for men or priests or somebody to be starting this up, we're not gonna get very far. Uh, but there's really a, a big role for uh, Muslim and Christian women to be, uh, to be deciding things. They've done a lot. A lot of practical work has been done in the Southern Philippines by women's organizations. They're one of the, the really key groups uh, in peacemaking. You know now, in, in peacemaking, up until maybe 20, 25 years ago, we were thinking of, of peacemaking as something imposed from above. We get all the, the, the leading military and political leaders and they come to a peace agreement and then it would filter down. And we discovered it doesn't work that way, that everybody's got to be playing their role. And the role of women's organizations in Southeast Asia, in any case, has been really a, a key to it. Yes? Does, do the three religions, Jewish, Christian, and uh, Muslim. Muslim, do they all go to Abraham as the father? Yes. One imam told me that. Yes. And further on, does Isaac, is he the one who would be the one who led the Christians and Jews, and Ishmael would be for the Muslim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it says in the Old Testament that Ishmael and Isaac got together to bury Abraham. Right. And, and this yeah, that's very is, good, yeah. I, I wonder if Islam takes its history from that son of Abraham all the way down to Mohammed somehow, and then goes on. Because You're, that would unite everybody through Abraham. I wonder, from your Islam studies, how yeah. you would feel about that. Time. Yeah. A few years ago, it must have been in the 1990s, we organized an Abrahamic meeting in, in uh, Turkey. We organized it in... in uh, in Haran. Haran is uh, where one of the places that's associated historically with Abraham, you'll find it in the, in, in the Bible. Uh, and near Haran is a city called Urfa, which is one of the claimants for the birthplace of, of Abraham, and you can still visit his, his uh, birthplace there. We had, uh, I think we invited 45 scholars about 15 Jews and Christians and Muslims, all to talk about what Abraham means for us. Because it's true what you say, that all of us trace our religion uh, to Abraham, but not always exactly in the same way. So it's important that we listen to what Jews are saying and that uh, Muslims listen to what we're saying and Jews listen to what Muslims are saying, et cetera. So we had about 15 scholars uh, uh, from all three religions giving one or another aspect of, uh, uh, of Abraham. But certainly Abraham was very important. I was talking today to one of the, in one of the classrooms here. <coughs> and at the time of uh, Muhammad, when he was living in, in, uh, in Mecca, he, he refused the pagan religion that was centered on the Kaaba. He, he rejected it. He said that the there's no moral guidance in this, and the many gods that they had were, were really not much better than humans. Humans, they were stealing each other's wives and that. So, like many conscientious Arabs at the time, they began to, they called themselves Hanifs, and they look back to Abraham as their ancestor, monotheist in, in, in faith. Now, it's true what you say in the Bible, uh, the one that, uh, Abraham was ordered to, to sacrifice was his son Isaac. Uh, this is, so this is what's followed in the Jewish and Christian tradition. In the Quran, it's uh, Ismail, the elder brother, the elder son. And, uh, and so uh, according to, to, actually in the Quran it doesn't say, it says when Abraham was told to kill his son, doesn't mention by name, but the Hadith, it does mention that, that, that it's Ismail, not, not Isaac. But, you know, this is the sort of thing we'll never convince, uh, you know, nobody will ever, I don't see any point of, of discussing it. No, but because, I was curious, yeah. Ismail was mentioned rather than Isaac? Yeah, yeah, in the Islamic sources, yeah. Well, I think that, okay, one final question. Well, all the way back. Of the, the mosque in, in Lower New York? 
Oh, I was, I was in favor. Muslims were always uh, already praying there. They need a place to worship. Uh, uh, oh, I've, I've been in favor. Yeah, certainly. I was in Turkey, so I was outside the whole argument, really. Uh, but certainly, I was in favor. Okay. Okay. Please join me in thanking Father Michel one more time. And everybody is invited, if you'll just hold on for two minutes here, everybody is invited uh, to join us outside the doors for uh, treats, Turkish treats and drinks, and the Gulen um, uh, Center, or the, the Golden Generation uh, Retreat Center is offering you a gift of a, a towel from the center. It's actually very nice. So please uh, feel free to do that. But before you leave, uh, Mr. Aksoy would like to come up and present Father uh, Michel with a gift, and then we're free to break. Thank you. Okay, so you're just going to have your treats. <laughs>